Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for Zooming in. I hope everyone has had a, a nice summer to this point. They, uh, they say that there's two sure things in this world, that's death and taxes. And none of you probably have the grim reaper at your door, but your property tax bill will be coming. Within the last half hour, we got the, uh, from the state, the, the school tax rate, finally. Uh, we've been waiting for that. It come in at uh, just a little over $1.58 for the non-homestead -home tax rate and a little bit over $1.63 for the homestead tax rate. Obviously, your individual tax bill will include the municipal rate taxes with the school rate. And depending on your assessed property value and your income sensitized prebate, it will adjust what you have for a tax bill. But you should expect them coming out at our next select board meeting, we would officially set the tax rate and then the bills should be coming out shortly thereafter and they would be due 30 days later. So you're probably looking at mid to late September for your first tax bill. I'm sure everyone was pretty excited waiting for that news. Uh, for those who may not have seen the, uh, as far as COVID-19 announcements, the uh, governor's news conference today, you may be aware that uh, the official school opening will be September 8th. He did share today that their goal is to have all fall sports available. It just will be not in the same fashion that you may have had in the past, but I'm sure that'll be really good for a lot of the kids who want to play football or cross country or what have you. So I guess that, that's really good news. He also indicated that uh, between the executive and the legislative branch, they have come up with quite a bit of money for child care providers, which is good to keep them going. And I just would say that uh, Vermont as a whole, we're one of, if not the best in the nation for rates of positive COVID-19. And Lamoille, we're, we're doing fair. We have 43 to date. Uh, but more and more importantly, I think is, uh, this illustrates how well Johnson has been doing and uh, we are currently zero. So that's, that's a good place to be. Hopefully we can stay there, um, but I'm sure eventually there will be a case in Johnson. As far as uh, some town announcements, the, uh, we have since our last Zoom broadcast, the play structures at all of our uh, recreational areas has been open to the public. Uh, they do have some restrictions on them and, and they're posted with signs. The municipal building is still closed to the public as far as meeting space upstairs. If you need to get in and see one of the uh, uh, municipal officials, you can call and make an appointment and we can get you in. The upstairs, until we figure out a way to be able to clean it between individual groups that meet up there, um, that's what we're struggling with. We don't really have a way of, of doing that, but uh, we'll continue trying to explore that. And I guess with that, we have two speakers tonight. I, uh, we felt that uh, there would probably be interest in the community on with the amount of kids or influx of students for the Johnson State, or Johnson State, the Northern Vermont University Johnson campus that come into our area, uh, you know, what kind of exposure that might give to the community, as well as our studio center, which historically has brought in residents from all over the world. And those are two areas of the greatest influx of potential concern that we would have. We have been working very closely with both organizations. Uh, while they would not have to do and, and report to us, they've been, uh, very collaborative and working together as well as with the town and just sharing what their protocols are looking at, the plans they've been putting in place. And it's, uh, we certainly wanted to share that to the community to reassure community members that they are taking this very serious 
and they are taking all measures possible that they to follow the CDC and Vermont Health Department guidelines. Before the speakers are introduced, I do want to officially welcome to Johnson the Executive Director Elizabeth Holford from for the uh, Vermont Studio Center. She's come in oh, about less than a month ago, I believe. And uh, what a way to come into your new job during a pandemic. But uh, I'm sure she will do a really good job. And she's certainly been nice to work with. And we certainly wish her well and welcome her to the community. So welcome, Elizabeth. So with that, let me introduce our two uh, speakers. Uh, we have first uh, Jonathan Davis, who is the Dean of Students at the Northern Vermont University, and he will tell us some of the protocols and measures, mitigation measures they're putting in place, as well as Elizabeth will fill us in on what the Vermont Studio Center is planning to do and is doing. And with that, who would we like to speak first, or who would like to speak first? And you can go ahead, Brian, and just open up both their mics, and we'll let them uh, fight over who speaks first. Jonathan, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth, and, and welcome. It's been a pleasure to work with you uh, so far. Um, Eric, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here, and I appreciate all the time that you've given me this summer to, to, to share uh, in, in what we're doing. Um, with the health and safety of the entire community in mind, our students, our staff, our faculty, our local communities in Linden and Johnson, uh, it's a pleasure to share uh, some of our plans. Um, it's important to note that um, this is new for everyone. We are literally writing the book here, um, but we feel like we're doing it with the best possible guidance from the Department of Health in Vermont, the CDC, um, and sharing good information between uh, institutions of higher ed across Vermont and the region. And so um, it's a pleasure to share a little bit of what we're doing. I, th I think I'll start by uh, giving you a picture of what the next couple of weeks look like for, for NVU Johnson. Um, this coming Sunday will be our first um, check-in, our first test, if you will, of of some of those protocols that we're putting in place. Uh, we're gonna welcome uh, approximately 35 students to the campus uh, to check into the residence halls. We also have some students that may be already be um, in the downtown area or on the outskirts in their apartments. They will test this coming Sunday between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. They will be screened upon arrival. Uh, it'll be a, a drive up format um, and uh, we're gonna be uh, testing for the first time. And so we're looking forward to seeing how that goes and. We know that we're gonna learn a lot from this small test that will better prepare us for the larger influx of students uh, starting on August 13th. Uh, it's important to note that we have some really incredible local partners that we're working with, Newport Ambulance being one of them, and also Copley Hospital. Hospital. Uh, Copley has uh, been wonderful in providing some educational opportunities to our faculty, staff, and students. In particular, I wanna thank Jody Legacy, the infection control specialist for the time that she has spent answering questions uh, about caring for face coverings, and disinfecting personal spaces, uh, and that's just been wonderful. Newport Ambulance will be uh, helping us on site at our testing stations and handling specimens for us and supervising our sites. We're incredibly grateful to their, for their time as well. And also, um, just today, I'll just note, we picked up uh, 20 gallons of awesome sanitizer from Green Mountain Distilleries, which we're excited to use not only at our testing sites, but at refill stations for our students as they uh, refill sanitizer bottles that we will be handing out to them. Our students will also be receiving a thermometer if they don't have one already. They have been encouraged to bring one. They'll be receiving an NVU logo mask. We're also encouraging them to bring extras. Uh, they'll be receiving a tether for that mask as well. I know myself, I don't know about you, but I've had the experience already of losing four or five high quality masks. Um, and uh, I've started to wear a, a tether so that I don't lose them. Um, we'll be encouraging our students to wash them frequently, and we will also have quite an inventory of surgical masks on hand if anyone needs one. I think our last count was 3,600. Um, so it's important to talk a little bit about our testing program uh, and some of the details there. We've partnered with a, a laboratory um, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Broad Institute. Uh, this uh, testing uh, laboratory is also being used by Middlebury and UVM. They offer a PCR nasal test. It's a bit of a, an easier swab, a self-swab, than your typical, um, your current 
test that you might find at a local hospital. Um, and so uh, as, as students drive up or walk up, and as faculty and staff do the same later on, uh, they'll be given that kit and they will do that test themselves and then someone will collect that specimen and tube and that will be shipped off immediately to the Broad Institute either via courier um, or a FedEx overnight or even by one of our own employees that drives it down. So um, we're expecting results in as soon as 24 hours but a maximum of probably 48 hours. Our community members will be notified by uh, email through a portal system that they log into if it's a negative result. The Vermont Department of Health um, and our ordering physician will be notified if there's a positive result. And we, we will then uh, create a plan if we need to notify a, a community, community member that they need to isolate immediately and provide other guidance. So we'll be testing our students on, on day zero or their day of arrival. And then we'll be testing them again on day seven. And then we'll be testing um, random samples of students throughout the rest of the fall semester. And we'll be leaving uh, by the way, uh, the students will be leaving uh, to return uh, to where they came from um, at Thanksgiving break. So we are starting, as a reminder, we're starting the semester earlier um, so that we can avoid the colder weather um, and uh, what some scientists are predicting is a, a surge possibly as the weather gets colder. So um, the rest of our exams after Thanksgiving will be done in a remote format. Um, another important um, uh, piece of the safety program for NVU is in a state requirement is that we have every community member sign what we're calling the NVU Health Pledge. It has gone out electronically to our entire community introduced by President Collins. Every community member will, uh, will sign that pledge. And uh, that is the, their full agreement and understanding of everything we expect from them, including daily screenings through an app called Castle Branch. This is an app that they can download on their smartphones or they can access through a regular computer to uh, report temperatures every morning. We can track history and trends across the campus as those come in. We can flag symptoms that students are reporting or anyone for that matter, and we can message them immediately through that app or by other means to instruct them to stay home, stay in their residence hall room, say if they have just one symptom, stay out of class and we can go through a rescreening process. Or if there are multiple symptoms, we can make a decision to move them to quarantine or isolation housing that we have prepared on campus. Our dining partner Sodexo is prepared to deliver meals where we need them. They have been amazing and very flexible. Um, and our public safety staffs, our counseling staffs are prepared to meet with students in need remotely as they did in the spring. And, and it's important to note that we learned a lot about what our students need in a virtual setting in the spring. Uh, so we, we feel like we're, we're in pretty good shape there. Um, we are constantly testing some of our plans across the state. We are a part of various uh, statewide committees, uh, weekly phone calls. Um, I, uh, every Tuesday morning, in touch with Commissioner Levine, and we are asking questions constantly. Uh, you can imagine how many emails are circulating across the state right now as we ramp up to this. Um, but we feel very good about what we have planned. Um, if I could, just I'm just going to pop up my screen back here. I went to sleep here, but. Um, we talk about things like uh, visitation. So our students living in the residence halls, we're expecting, by the way, at Johnson, a roughly 300, give or take, 10 on either side. There is still some time before the semester begins, so we have students that may be thinking about a remote format. Uh, they do have the ability to contact the school, their advisor, academic support, and make some adjustments. Um, also do, important to note that because of that, our density on campus is reduced. Uh, we'll be starting the year uh, with fewer students in the residence halls than we typically would. All of those students are going to be in single rooms. Um, and then we also have space for quarantine housing. So that is an important part of the equation in terms of safety and not sharing that space. And we're, we're, we're very happy that we can do that. And certainly that was a big part of our decision uh, to do this. Um, we will be um, asking students, staff, and faculty to strictly adhere to ACCD travel guidance. Um, and to a quarantine as appropriate if they uh, travel to um, a quarantine county. We're asking them not to. Um, and uh, we expect to uh, monitor that closely just in terms of you know, maintaining communication. Uh, you can imagine we have small campuses at MBU. Um, information travels fast and if we have to um, address something, uh, we can typically do it very quickly and follow up quickly. And so we're asking uh, them to follow those travel restrictions 
Uh, we will not be allowing off-campus visitors into our residence halls. That will be a very strict rule, and we'll be monitoring access to the buildings to make sure and asking our public safety staff to, to go the extra mile to make sure and monitor our entrances. But our students um, have pledged uh, to, to uphold that. Um, I mentioned the academic calendar. Let me talk a little bit about campus events and what you might see on the campus. We will have uh, fewer uh, large events. Um, if we do have events, uh, they will be safely distanced outdoors for the most part while the weather cooperates. We've uh, installed um, two or three tents on each of our campuses. The Johnson campus typically has a couple of outdoor tents that we use on the quad. Um, and we intend to use those. We intend to have furniture under those tents. Again, while the weather is, is good, we're going to be uh, marking off spots where it's safe to sit. Um, and um, we expect that to be um, attractive to even some classes. Um, our conference and event services will, will manage reservations for those areas. Um, and so we expect to see a lot of creativity and how to gather safely. Um, and so outside, outside is, the, is the choice. And so we figure we have till about uh, maybe mid-October to really take advantage of that before it starts to turn a little cold. Of course, we're requiring facial coverings at all times. Uh, there are no exceptions. There are ADA accommodations, of course, um, and within reason, uh, we will accommodate those who need it. However, for the, on the student side, um, certainly one of the accommodations will be a remote format. Our faculty and staff also have the opportunity to apply for accommodations in terms of the, um, whether they can work in remotely or not, and several will be. Uh, but there are, of course, some positions that are, rely on a on a face-to-face -face, um, uh, format. So um, we have lots of signage uh, going up around the campus in our dining halls. We have floor decals. Uh, we have um, um, we'll have signs on all of the main entrances about who is coming to the campus, um, who needs to be screened by public safety. Um, and so we're working on that now and, and, and ramping it up. Our communications and marketing department is working overtime to produce some really attractive uh, sign templates that each of the departments can use. So, um, you know, in the Dewey Hall, for example, uh, where a lot of our face-to-face -face direct student services are, we'll be uh, making sure that we have dedicated larger spaces so that we can continue to meet with students in a safe way if they're not comfortable in a virtual format. Um, and so we're currently uh, working hard on that. Cleaning and disinfecting, our physical plant staff is going to be working extremely hard every day to deep clean classrooms and other high touch areas across the campus. Um, we'll be providing cleaning supplies in those areas as well so that students, staff, and faculty can clean and disinfect spaces around them. Um, we'll be removing uh, keyboards and mice in computer labs to ensure that we have distance. Um, and uh, lots of furniture, as you can imagine, has been moved around. If it's safe to stack it somewhere, then we have done that. And in other places, we've completely moved furniture out. And a big important part of that is in the dining hall, of course. Our Sodexo partners have worked hard to sort of uh, manage that. We've removed furniture. Uh, we now have reduced capacity in those areas, and we will operate those areas with a head count. So uh, once we reach a certain head count in that area, students, faculty, and staff will have an opportunity to do a takeout option. Um, some of them, we expect many of them to do that anyways, but uh, we feel like that's going to be a safe option. Um, however, it is always important to note that we're going to see how this goes. If we have to pivot and make a change, we're absolutely going to do that. Uh, for many of us, COVID-19 response is going to be our job for the rest of 2020 and not much else. And um, it's just going to be a 24-hour-a-day uh, job, and um, it's worth it. Our students are hungry to come back. They're excited to come back. They learn best in a face-to-face -face format, and that's why they chose NVU, and um, we're excited to welcome them back. No doubt a lot of hard work, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, before we open up for questions, we probably should get to Elizabeth, and then we'll open up to both of them. That seem, seems fair. Great. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I think probably in one of the most unusual times in, in certainly in the history of this village and in the history of BSC. I don't know if I've ever started a job sort of behind closed doors. When I came, I uh, very strictly quarantined for 14 days and learned of the graciousness and kindness of the BSC staff. And I have to say this is probably, aside from being a beautiful place to live, it is uh, 
probably one of the friendliest places that I've moved to. So to all of you on this call and uh, to the rest of you and certainly to Eric and Jonathan, thank you so much. I'm very, very grateful. Happy to be here. We've taken a, a little different tact. Uh, you may have noticed in July that we were, we hosted a week long residency that was a Vermont only residency. And we, in that situation, we had 22 people coming in only from counties that had, uh, that were in the uh, 400 or less, 400 or less cases per million. Uh, we determined and required that uh, people follow all of the Ver Vermont uh, Health uh, Department of Health requirements before coming in. They also signed a, an agreement, a, a compliance agreement, uh, that included all of the things, all of the safety guidelines that they would be required to follow. We tested everyone as they came in, and then we had a daily test, a self-report daily test on symptoms and temperature every day. The staff, uh, it's no, no one wants to be the police person, but uh, all staff agreed to and on site uh, have been responsible for reminding residents to comply with guidelines. We also only invited as many residents to, uh, to our campus as we had private bathrooms for. So there was no, uh, no contact in terms of bathrooms or living situation or studios. Outside, we required that people follow Vermont's uh, social dis distancing guidelines. Uh, and then we also have in place the specific after monitoring of health conditions if there was any, if there were any symptoms, there were not, uh, both in the Vermont week of 22 people and then the six that stayed on for a second week. Uh, but we have protocol, uh, not only, we have protocol that uh, not only the, uh, if there were, had been any symptoms that the people would be asked to uh, first self-isolate and, and then leave with follow-up to find out, uh, to test and then to find out if they had tested positive. We haven't crossed that bridge at this time, and uh, we certainly are hopeful that we will not. We've also kept our staff presence lower than usual. Uh, we continue people to work remotely or work remotely on certain days and switch off with other people on other days. Uh, we follow all of the CDC guidelines in terms of cleaning and disinfecting, uh, everything, banisters, railing, doorknobs, light switches, uh, everything that we can. Housekeeping is providing all residents with cleaning kits with uh, advice for cleaning their own spaces, their rooms, their kitchens, their bathrooms, and supplies are provided for uh, at every doorknob that we have to maintain clean doorknobs with instructions uh, in, in our cleaning kits on how to uh, take care of your workspace uh, for employees and also how to uh, take care of uh, bathrooms and living spaces for residents. When residents enter the Red Mill, they are uh, certainly welcome and they also receive a temperature and sim uh, symptom check. That's where that we are recording those. And uh, all of our residents are encouraged to, uh, required to, not just encouraged, <laughs> required to uh, come in a staggered time so that we do not have anybody closer than six feet in terms of as they come in, but also if they choose to dine in the dining room. People are allowed to uh, take, you may have noticed that tent, uh, the tented area is uh, an area for, can be for meals, uh, but also for socializing, but residents are required outdoors to remain six feet apart or, uh, or alone in their studios and six feet apart or masked. We've all been following these protocols. We will continue to follow them. We may not have noticed we have another group in that started uh, just this week. Uh, we have 21, all, all again, are, all are from Vermont except for one from New Hampshire, and that is also a low incident count, incidence county. The same protocols applied. And again, if there, is, uh, any pro if there are any problems detected, we have protocols in place for immediate notification, and uh, everyone that's here or has been here is required, uh, if they have any symptoms, to uh, leave immediately. If they're not able to drive, we have an emergency person that they've already provided their information to us who will be contacted to come get them, or uh, if both of those options fail, um, emergency, uh, if, if they will be required to uh, take emergency to uh, take emergency vehicle to the hospital. 
So those are our current protocols. We expect uh, the current group of 21 to be here, the 21 Vermonters plus one from New Hampshire, to be here uh, for two weeks and then past that we have seven that are staying. Uh, again, it's not a new group, but it'll be seven of the artists and, and or writers that will be for, here for an additional week. Okay, thank you both. So Brian, why don't we go ahead and open it up for questions now. And I think Scott was gonna be the first one. Yeah, so thank you both. Anybody who has questions again, uh, raise your hand using the uh, button in Zoom. If you're on the phone, you can dial star six nine. Uh, we had a question from Scott up first. Um, Jonathan, this question is for you. Um, and one is the protocol for married student housing and how that works. And the other, the second part is also offsite housing, usually done through village rentals and how that's going to be um, dealt with. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, so married student housing, you're referring to the campus apartments, I assume? Okay. So they will have, I have a colleague on the, on the line, uh, Jeff Bickford is, I think, here. Um, and so I can have him address the campus apartments specifically. But the off-campus students in the apartments downtown are expected to follow the, um, their commitments to the pledge and our instructions and any quarantine and isolation instructions where they are. We, will, we do not have the space to isolate or quarantine them up on the campus, but they will be expected to follow the same screening protocols using the Castle Branch app. Um, and also they will follow the same protocols if there is a positive test as far as us contacting them with support from the, the, the Department of Health, any contact tracing investigations. But so there are some definitely some big decisions there that they will need to make in the event that that happens if there's a positive case or if they're report, reporting multiple symptoms. But our instructions will be the same. And it, is, is it OK if I have Jeff answer uh, for the apartments? Yeah, sure. Eric? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Hello. Um, I'm not going to turn my video on because I'm actually doing some pre-move-in assessments of some apartments right now. So I'm right up the, right there. Um, basically, several years ago, we actually started in terms of policy and protocol and procedure, treating the campus apartments as a residence hall. Um, I, a number of years ago, we started to see more and more of the students who live there. Um, our traditional age students, but upperclassmen who want to remain on campus, but also have, you know, a little bit more independence, certainly than being in a traditional hallway style. Um, we do have a few families, certainly, that live here um, year over year, um, but generally speaking, we treat them pretty similarly, certainly with some more freedoms around break housing and things like that. So um, we actually have a few people who have self-identified as, yep, you know, like I'm going to be flying in. So they're actually going to start in quarantine housing before they move into their campus apartment. Uh, there are a couple situations where both people have been together, you know, living in the same space, and now they're going to move into their apartment so they can self-isolate together. Uh, but the expectations for testing, uh, for self-isolation, if they're coming from a high density, you know, high case density area, um, and for, you know, using a council branch app for, um, you know, just self-disclosing if there's any symptoms and for all, you know, isolating and, and everything else is going to be the exact same for everyone who's in the res halls. Walter, I've got you up next. Okay, Walter. great. Uh, first, a comment for you, Jonathan, and then a question. Um, hopefully, education and enforcement is going to be taken very, very seriously, especially with the off-campus students. Just as an example, last week I watched, I'm assuming there were students because I heard the conversation. I sat, watched them at a local swimming hole passing the pipe around. So that would be behavior that would, really would not be conducive to um, isolation and COVID restrictions, et cetera. So that's just my comment. So I hope, especially with the off-campus students, you are going to be educating and enforcing. Um, my question is, a lot of us community members like to use the facilities up at the campus. Um, specifically, I know tomorrow morning I'm going to go play tennis, uh, the hiking trails. I know in the past I've gone to lectures, concerts, and I'm sure a lot of people want to know about the shape facilities. So what restrictions or rules are going to apply to us community members 
in terms of using the facilities up on campus? Thanks for the question, Walter. You hit on a topic that we don't have a final uh, solution for yet. It's an active conversation just about every day. So let me start with that, with the SHAPE facility. Uh, we are still evaluating what we can handle um, and um, whether or not we can sort of maintain a bubble, if you will, by having uh, external community members visit a facility like that. Our physical plant staff is evaluating how much time they can spend in the facility each day, and we're also evaluating whether or not we can rely on our current student employee staff to wipe down equipment and clean areas. We're evaluating whether or not we can open the pool, and we're looking at best practice in the region for that. Um, as far as the outdoor facilities and coming up to use the hiking trails or the tennis courts, we did put tennis nets back up midsummer. If you'll remember that that was one of the first sports that uh, Governor Scott uh, sort of opened the spigot for was I think golf and tennis. And so we were able to do that. If we see trends, and this goes back to your comment as well, if we're getting reports that are not favorable in terms of safety, then we're gonna have to make some decisions, but we're gonna try, try, try to educate first and see if we can count on people to make good decisions about that. So we are going to welcome people to walk on the campus, to use the trails, but if we start to see a lot of traffic and we start to see a lot of um, activity in the center part of campus, um, then we're gonna to have to make some, some changes. And, and, and that's kind of going back to, this is all very new, um, and we're all going to be focused on this, and, uh, but we are committed to that education piece. We are committed to reaching out to the students if we see an issue. We've been meeting with our students, by the way. We've had a couple of different student town halls through our Student Government Association, so we're hearing from them. We're hearing that they're not excited about virtual activities, for example. They do want to gather, but obviously you pointed out a, a really good example of where um, more education is going to be necessary. And when a community member forwards a concern, if I hear from Eric about a situation downtown, uh, I'm gonna ask people like Jeff and public safety to help me follow up on that and see what's going on and, and see if we need to take some action uh, with the student code of conduct in mind. Anybody got a softball for Elizabeth? It's her first time zooming in on the in the community. Uh, Peggy's got her hand up. So Peggy Williams. Uh, hey, am I unmuted? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Eric, this uh, pre predates your comment about uh, uh, softball for Elizabeth. It's, uh, it's not a softball for either, just, uh, and I know we're not necessarily finished, I just, I have only a beginning understanding of all that's involved in trying to open, and so I just commend the two of you and your teams, uh, you know, to try to pull this together. It's terribly complicated. It's also very important that artists come to the Studio Center and that students come to campus, so I just commend you for what you've done so far, and uh, hope it all hope it works as well as it can. So nice to see you, President Williams. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have anyone else, Brian? I'm not seeing anybody. Walter had asked a question I was interested in about the shape facility, so I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about that and working on it. Um, you know. The, I will I will commit to you that we'll have a sort of a, a, a direct response to that soon and, and certainly an, an announcement for everyone. Excellent. Uh, and we do have a, a question by phone. Yes, this is this oh, is Valerie ahead. Valcork. This is Valerie Valcork. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Valerie. Yes, I just uh, for this would be for both um, Elizabeth and for Jonathan. Oh, and, and for the town, um, mostly for the town, I think, um, for what is the best process for any community members to share their concerns or further questions um, that that a process that um, could facilitate a, a positive communication exchange? Probably if anybody had a on a ongoing uh, question later on or a concern that came up if they were to share that with any of the uh, town or village officials, Brian's a good one, Meredith from the village is a good one, and we can bring it, get it directly to either uh, the NVU or the studio center. Uh, the Northern Vermont University website, Safe Return, and I'll put the link in the chat, uh, is a great way uh, to look at all the updated university communications regarding COVID-19 
And also there's a, an area where anyone can uh, post a question. Uh, and those questions will be coming to a, a number of university officials that will get back to you pretty quickly. Perfect. I believe we have an email that is info at, but I'm looking to my staff members to make sure I'm right about that. But uh, info at Vermont Studio Center dot org. Uh, but you can also call and uh, truly just ask for me and I'll, I'll answer your questions. Perfect. Does that answer your concern, Valerie? Yeah, I just I just wanted to make a point that um, we want to promote positive communication, um, information exchange, and um, try to alleviate some of the rumor mills and such. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, and then uh, Scott, you had a second question. So Jonathan and Elizabeth, these are both questions for you folks. In the event you do have a positive test or a small cluster, um, of course, this is all going to be um, dealt with by the Vermont Department of Health and their contact tracing team. <clears throat> but notification to the town, and this gets a little dicey for medical privacy issues, is there some kind of link um, between um, the emergency management team with the town of Johnson and any kind of cluster or positive test that you folks may have. Um, obviously, we would be interested in that so we could ramp up on the town and village side um, without sort of, you know, doing a medical disclosure and pinning people down. I know Dr. Levine has had issues sort of calling out cases and where they're happening specifically. But is there a route of information that you're planning on? And Jonathan, if you could answer that first, that'd be great. And then go to Elizabeth. Sure. Thanks for that question, Scott. It's a really good question. The Department of Health will be the incident commander for these situations if they do happen at NBU. And we will um, uh, be working closely with them and getting information that they need and meeting with them if they come to campus. So we will lean on them heavily in terms of next steps as far as sharing anything public. But from that point, if it does happen, we will be preparing communications and seeking their approval as to what is appropriate to share. And I am certain that um, the, the town of Johnson would be among the key stakeholders in that process. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't want to say same and ditto, but we, our protocols start with uh, going directly to the state and following exactly the, and, and I know that their protocols have changed. So uh, doing exactly everything up until that notice that is currently required and then to, again, let them take the lead. And uh, I, I also assume that the town would be notified. Okay, thanks. Through the state. Thank you. And uh, Gordy, I, I, did you raise your hand? Okay, uh, hold on a sec, Gordy, I've got to unmute you. On behalf of the village and having lived here in this community for a long time, I want to thank Jonathan and Elizabeth for all that you've done and your staff, because I cannot imagine our community without the studio center or the college on the hill or university. So I just want to say thanks and um, I just hope it works out and there's going to be a few bumps in the road, but our community has been through a lot in the last 50 years, but we've always found a way to get through them. So I just want to say to both of you, don't give up. And thank you for all that you and your staff are doing for our community and for the associations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. And just for full disclosure, because I'm not sure if, if the two of you know who some of these folks are that have been speaking, but Gordy is the chair of the village trustees, Scott, and a member of the emergency management team. He's the uh, uh, emergency management uh, coordinator. And, uh, for, and Scott is also on the emergency management team and he's a village trustee. So that's some of where their background is and some of the questions you've been getting. And Valerie is uh, from Morrisville area, part of the state health department, I believe. But uh, so just so you guys know who your audience is, I guess, Maybe we, uh, if, if somebody on the call has a question and they're an, an official, they probably should introduce themselves because you guys may not know them. 
And I think you know me, so. Uh, I see. Uh, okay, Doug, go ahead. Uh, this is Doug Moldy. I, I'm uh, on the select board. My, my question for Jonathan is, uh, uh, are there gatekeepers at, at, uh, at the campus? Uh, if, uh, to what extent do people, you know, I, I heard you talking about specific activities, exploring shape facilities, but what about just, uh, you know, if you're in, if you're in Canada and you're in the wrong province, they don't like you anymore. You know, how about, uh, to, to what extent is there an exclusionary or do you think there should be an exclusionary uh, position up there for like town residents or anyone other than students or faculty? Yeah, it, it, thank you. It's, it's, it's an important conversation that we continue to have as far as is, is limiting uh, presence on the campus. So we're happy to have people outside. Um, and we know that we're going to have, we're working on a couple of different visitor um, protocols right now. For instance, you know, one important part of the NVU campus is, is how is our prospective students and their families who want to see the campus. Um, this is a beautiful area to go to school and, and, and people want to come to the campus and see it. And so we're, we're being very careful in how we plan it. We're looking at best practice, but we want to invite those people safely here. That's one of the reasons for the tents. We feel like we could safely accommodate some of those needs uh, by keeping the tours outside. Um, but we definitely want the town to feel comfortable up here. The town is such a critical partner in every single way. Um, and if there's a way that we can make it work, we will. But there may be some cases where it's going to be just tough to let anyone in. And, and I will just be uh, very forthcoming that, that that shape conversation is a difficult one. Um, so um, we're working hard on it, though. And um, we know how important that facility is in this area. And we'll, hopefully we can find a way. But um, we're not going to have, back to the gatekeeper comment, uh, we don't have the staff and we have a very open campus in terms of open entrances. Uh, we don't have uh, motion sensitive cameras set up or alarm systems, but there's going to be a, a greater deal of, I mean, greater a level of, um, you know, people keeping an eye out for who they haven't seen before. And I do expect some of those concerns to flow through public safety. And, you know, I had that experience myself today where I saw a group, you know, larger than five walk through the Martinetti parking lot and uh, it caught my eye and I was wanting to know who they were and I was wanting to know if they had a mask on uh, and they did and they were distanced. And, um, and then I, I went back to what I was doing, but for sure, everyone's guard is up. Um, and, and I think right now that's, probably going to be the have to the have to be the way that we we tackle this but um, I'm sure hoping uh, for a successful vaccine process so that we can uh, get started again the way we want to be in the spring. Jen Fortman has got a question. All right Jen. Hi there uh, this is actually Jeff Snyder on uh, Jen's um, account sitting next to me here. Uh, my question relates to the first 24 hours 24 to 48 hours that students are are on campus um, I know that, you know, it's an exciting time for students to, to arrive on campus and to socialize and to see each other. And I'm curious about the 24-hour um, um, test um, response as far as, you know, getting those results back. And I'm wondering if there's anything that's going to be limiting for students to be able to, you know, still see each other, but they're not going to know if they have a positive or negative test result for that first 24 to 48 hours. So I'm curious about how that's going to work and what kind of contact tracing mechanism might be in place should a test result come back positive for one of those students. Yeah, uh, Jeff, thanks for that question. It's an important one. Uh, so, so we are asking those students as they arrive to stay put on campus or stay put in their apartments uh, until those first test results uh, come back. Um, we've been very clear about that. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I mentioned in the opening as well that we do have a staggered check-in process. So uh, our check-ins are going to be over the course of four different days, all day long for the most part. And so we're staggering people. So uh, what you, you may have seen in the past with lots of dumpsters full of cardboard as people move in and no parking anywhere, uh, this is going to be uh, much uh, far more controlled there. Um, but there is a degree of trust here involved that we're asking the students to do the right thing so that we can stay open and keep our community safe and the town safe to not do anything until those first results come back as a precaution. But we do not have, uh, you know, an ironclad um, way to do that. If we see or witness or have evidence of an egregious violation, we may take immediate action 
uh, through the student code of conduct. Um, that's certainly a possibility, but I'm hoping that we don't have to do that. Um, the second part of your question involved contact tracing, and that's also critical. Um, we're asking students to keep an informal journal of contacts they have, uh, mostly contacts of you know uh, more than 10 minutes at a time with a fellow student or someone else. Uh, we're, we're going to be tracking them. Uh, I hate to use that word, but it really is what we're going to be doing in the dining hall when they swipe in with their cards. We're going to know we're going to have a date, a date and time stamp of when they arrived in the dining hall. We're working on a, a second level to that as far as a sign-in process for the table they may sit at. We're going to be tracking face-to-face uh, -face classes and who goes to class. Um, and um, we're going to be asking uh, also, by the way, out-of-state students as they come into the state to register for SARA alert um, so that they can be uh, communicated with by the state for the first 14 days. Um, it's going to be a bit of a wake-up call um, for many students coming in. Their first taste of that is going to be a drive-through check-in, which they're certainly not used to. We're used to welcoming in the inside of the campus on the beautiful quad under a tent, and everyone's hugging each other and, and welcoming people back, and we're welcoming new students back. It's going to be very different. Um, and so I'm, I, I, under, I am very nervous about it, um, getting some gray, here, gray hair here, uh, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work, I hope. Just for you, okay. Eric. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it wouldn't be a Zoom broadcast without you asking a question. I'm actually not going to ask the question. I'm just going to say, Jonathan, thanks to, to you and everyone of, of the U team. I know that you've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into your plans. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. Uh, and Elizabeth, welcome. Um, you've joined a great community, and we're very happy to have you. Um, Thank you. And also, just to add on to what Gordy said, I can imagine our community without um, the Studio Center and without NVU, and it ain't pretty. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. Um, the thing that my little pitch, my little plug, I put it in the chat window, but there's also a school board meeting tonight beginning at 6 p.m. that's going to talk about plans to go back to school for both the elementary, well, K through 12, essentially. Um, and then also just FYI, in case folks haven't heard, there's also going to be community meetings um, for specific schools next week. I know the Hyde Park High School meeting will be on Friday. And if I remember correctly, Johnson is either Monday or Tuesday. Sorry, I don't remember which day. Um, but I just wanted to let folks know that while we're here. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Leah has put a, uh, a little bit of information in chat. Uh, and I'll, I'll direct this at Dan because he's here. Uh, Legislature is going to be reconvening soon and they're going to be talking about the budget. So we do want to uh, put a plug in again for the needs that uh, the NVU Johnson campus has and how important that is to all of our community and how much we support action to uh, ensure the successful future of our university. So, yeah. I'm not sure if Dan was aware of the value that we place in having NVU campus in Johnson. Yeah, Just that could be a, a surprise to him. Of... <laughs> hey, okay, okay. I'm off mute, right on. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah absolutely. Uh, I know it's going to be definitely um, something we'll be talking about and uh, making sure that the uh, there's adequate funding to to get through these times so yes we go back on the 26th and we'll be there until we pass the, the remainder part of the budget thank you thanks dan thank for you. everything you've been doing oh, and uh john greg has his hand up uh, okay okay there you go john uh jonathan without casting aspersions at a particular age group, what is the school going to do about alcohol? Because all of the things you've said are admirable. They are less enforceable under the influence of alcohol and college students do drink. Are you paying any particular attention to that and trying to find ways to limit forgetfulness caused by drinking? It's a great question. And, um, you know, also, there's just not enough time here to, to talk about everything that we've been thinking about. But along those lines, our, 
our thoughts around programming have to change with a compressed semester and no break that also adds of anxiety and pressure to students. And so drinking is among them. We have limitations in terms of how, where our staff are going to be uh, traveling in residence halls. So you're right, it's, there's ample opportunity to make some less than desirable decisions that impact their ability to comply with safety practices. So uh, Jeff Bickford and his staff are, are actively um, considering that now and thinking of ways to intervene and educate. Our, um, I, I know that Margot Warden is on this call. Thanks, Margot, for reaching out, who, who would uh, typically be presiding over our wonderful Creative Audience program that would be also trying to address these issues, providing our students not only with other alternative activities, but also some tremendous education around those impacts uh, of drinking. But um, it, is, it is the risk, certainly, um, and it's something we're going to be watching closely. And also, if you have any suggestions, uh, I would love to hear them. Um, and uh, I can certainly update you at a later date to tell you how it's going. Um, I'm sure that some of you will see some of it uh, yourself, and, and uh, I would appreciate hearing about it if you do. Thank you. Uh, and I believe that uh, Jeff has a comment on this as well. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so I oversee the staff that do a lot of the um, kind of in-residence hall, um, just being aware of people's status and a lot of the follow-up when there are alcohol issues. I can tell you it's certainly one of the things that's keeping me up at night, but we are um, training our staff to just be really aware early on of any self-isolating behaviors and we're being even more proactive than usual about really being purposeful about connecting with people early and often. Uh, I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to get some uh, educational initiatives that we can bring in in a few different ways, whether they're from outside or inside, we will be doing a number of educational in initiatives. And um, we already do a lot of education around um, risk management, and uh, harm reduction in regard to alcohol use. And it's something that is constantly on our mind and we're gonna be as proactive about it as we possibly can. And hopefully that'll head off um, some of those problems. We certainly, and we certainly have anticipated, everybody has their own room. Lots of people are doing lots of their classwork remotely. That can lead to a lot of um, potential substance abuse issues and substance overuse. And we're absolutely um, being as proactive as we, as we possibly can to counteract as much of that as possible. Jonathan oh, and Jeff, I haven't heard you say anything about consequences. I know at the studio center, it's always been a policy that if people are abusing substances, they're asked to leave. Are you telling your students, your incoming students and your returning students that there is a no tolerance policy which has been enforced or, or necessarily is enforced because of the virus situation. I mean, you ha you've talked about education and suggestion. Is there any enforcement behind that? I would, uh, my, 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 I'm gonna let Jeff follow up after my comment on that, but um, we are not putting out uh, anything about um, zero tolerance. Uh, we have always been, a, our philosophy for our conduct process has been about education. Um, and learning from mistakes. However, uh, we have been clear that um, uh, we will impose even a, a temporary suspension pending a hearing if we uh, witness egregious behaviors that put others' health and safety in jeopardy, especially in light of the pandemic. Um, but for the most part, um, our aim is to educate students, to have good positive conversations, to help them understand the impact that their behavior has on others. And I, I expect us to continue with that. Jeff, do you have something to add there? Yeah, just, um, you know, we've, we've found, and I've got some data that's helpful with this, and, and there's some good research around this, that when we say no, no tolerance to college students, it's uh, often met with a response of, all right, challenge accepted, uh, as opposed to really looking at um, education, harm reduction, uh, mitigation of the risk of overuse, and uh, really looking at restorative stuff. That said, certainly consistent with how we've handled conduct infractions um, always, is that if somebody is not learning and the behavior is egregious and the behavior is um, 
putting other campus members at risk and putting the well-being of the campus at risk and no willingness to learn and change from that behavior, then yeah, well, we absolutely would feel comfortable um, asking them to leave. But certainly, you know, we're not, we're not about to put in uh, ultimatums or kind of say zero tolerance because they're just not effective with college students. Um, but yes, yes, there are consequences. Yes, there is follow-up and enforcement. Uh, everything we know about, we follow up with and there is uh, a disciplinary follow-up. Thank you. Uh, Brian, we are at the top of the hour and I know some folks want to switch over to the school board meeting. And if there's no further questions, I think we should, and we have no entertainment tonight. Nope. So I think we probably would want to wrap it up, but I do want to thank both Jonathan and Elizabeth for, for doing this, uh, being the featured speakers and telling us about the uh, protocols you're putting in place at your two uh, entities. And it certainly is a, a very a pleasure to work with both of you. And I do appreciate your collaboration with the community and keeping us informed and looped in. And uh, I know I personally appreciate everything you both are doing. And I think the whole community probably does too. So with thank that, you. thank you all. Thank Have you. Have a good evening. Thank you both. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight.